We are going home. That was not a coincidence. All right, how's everyone tonight? Be careful when you put cayenne pepper on your popcorn. <laughs> it's legal, but it can be lethal, okay? You know what I'm saying? All right. <clears throat> I'm really excited tonight to be able to share this uh, program with you. I want to give you a little bit of background. Um, and I'm not sure what's on the slide. Okay, I see what's on the slide. So here we'll go here. Who am I? And I was actually invited to speak at an academy. And this academy had K through 12th grade. And so they said, we're going to allow you to speak to the children, you know, every day from 9 o'clock to 10.30 or whatever. And I said, well, wait a minute. You're going to have the K through 6th graders listen to what I talk to the, you know, 7th through 12th graders? And they said, yeah, is that a problem? I go, well, well, yeah, it is, because I can't share with the, with the K through 6th graders what I want to share with the older group. I said, but the little kids need something, too. And they said, well, we'll just we'll leave out K through 6th grade, and you can just speak to the, uh, to the young adults. And I said, no, no, wait a minute. The world is already trying to educate our children even before they get to school. And then once they get to school, then they educate them even more. I said, we need to have something for the younger kids. So the Lord really impressed me um, to kind of make it simple and make it plain. And how can we educate our children about identity and sexuality without instructing them? But how can we do that in a foundational way so that when they're exposed to the darkness, when they're exposed to the things that are untrue about God, that they would be prepared to be able to handle it, right? Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we want as parents? Raise your hand if you're a parent of a young person. All right, raise your hand if you're a parent of an old person. doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. So, again, isn't that the challenge today is how can we educate our children so that we're not instructing them but giving them the foundations of God about identity and sexuality to prepare them, you know, and to arm them for when deception comes. So that's what this program is about. I wanna, I'm going to fill it in with some adult things, you know, so it's not too primary for you. But I also want to break it down and show you if you are a parent how you can introduce these concepts to your children in a way that is not going to harm their, their, um, um, their sensibilities and also instruct them in ways that they shouldn't go, but also to prepare them because isn't that our responsibility is to prepare them for the world that we're living in. So without further ado, I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, and um, it's been an incredible day to be able to connect with old friends and new friends, to meet new people, to have conversations, and also, Lord, to experience the goodness that you have prepared and set aside by your, your very presence, Lord, being in this day, and Lord, we appreciate it. I love how somebody was saying earlier that we shouldn't rush into our secular world, but yet we should savor every moment that we have of the Sabbath hours. And so, Lord, as the Sabbath is approaching and we go into this program, Lord, we just ask that you would extend that blessing for the time that we're together tonight. That, Lord, that maybe rather than the times when we fly into the Sabbath and, and, and begin our worship with you, that, Lord, that as the Sabbath is ending, that we would slide out of the Sabbath as well. So, Lord, um, be with us, I pray. Send your Holy Spirit, illumine us, enlighten us, and equip us, Lord, for the onslaught that is coming that is already here at the door. And I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, while I was in Europe, I just want to tell you this amazing thing, amazing thing. There were a lot of miracles that happened while I was gone for those six months. And, of course, many opportunities opened up for me to speak. But I actually went to Bogenhofen Seminary College. Anyone ever heard of it? That's okay. It's there. Trust me. It's in Austria. And I got to stay in a castle. So, for a homeless guy living in an RV, that was really a lot of fun to be able to say that I'm staying in a castle. So while I was staying at, in Bogenhofen, uh, the first time that I was there, I actually gave this program uh, to the educating students and also to the, to the faculty of the education department. When I was done giving this program, I said to the director of the education department, who I've known for about five years, I said, I really want to put together a resource, <laughs> right? I want to put together a resource so that we can educate our children. We can use it for parents. We can use it for teachers. We can use it for Sabbath school teachers. Wouldn't it be great to have a resource where we can be in charge of educating our children about identity and sexuality in the biblical way that's safe for them? Wouldn't that be a good resource to have? 
So isn't that interesting? It takes an ex-gay hairdresser who's never been married or had children to be able to put some of these thoughts together. But I think that you'll find it valuable because they did. And when I was done with that program, the, uh, the director of the education department, she said, listen, I really see that we could use this resource. And she said, in Austria and in many countries, they have this law that even if, you're, um, even if you're in an Adventist school, a Christian school, what happens is the sex education workers, they come in and they excuse the teachers out of the classroom and the sex educators, they ad actually educate your children about sex from kindergarten on up. And she said this, she said, I want a curriculum, I want a certification where when my educators graduate from Bogenhofen Seminary that they can actually go out into the world and they are actually sex educators themselves but with this program rather than what the world does. Isn't that amazing? And then that way it would eliminate having the government step in and bring in their sex educators. Y'all look a little bit stunned. Is that okay? Right? Isn't that a good thing? Okay. All right. Good. Good. Are you tired? Maybe you're tired. It's all right. You didn't have cayenne in your, in your popcorn, I know, so, so bear with me. So anyway, I was amazed by that. But listen, the best part comes after this. I was walking back to the castle, and as I was walking back to the castle, this young woman comes up to me, and she said, listen, I was really touched by your program, and she said this. She said, I actually just got a master's, a master's degree, and she said, and while I was in my master's training, I actually became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And she said, I actually have a master's, get this, in gender studies. Wow. I know, I know, I know, right? So she says, I've got a master's in gender studies, and I would love to help you with this program if you would let me. Come on, you guys, that's a big deal. <laughs> that God is amazing, isn't it? He will allow somebody that's the director of education at a seminary college to help work on this project with a hairdresser, ex-gay, person that never had children and also we're going to have a person with a master's in gender studies who believes in biblical sexuality working on this program thank you thank you okay i there's hope for you there's hope for you guys okay oh we got locked out because i took too long okay we're back so i want to share this with you and there are many opinions that are going around and there are many opinions going around in our schools and i think that i made that clear when i was speaking earlier today but I want to read to you this, and I, I think that it's amazing that Ellen White was so clear on what's coming. And you know, isn't it wonderful? Uh-oh, what did I do? Oh, it's still there, but I can't see it. Okay, let me see. Okay, guys, I lost the screen. I can't see what's coming. I know they're, they're all up in there, like, waving and stuff. That's all right, we'll figure it out. So I want to share with you this quote, but I can't read it to you. Oh, now it's not moving. There was a tab that came up and it said close. So I closed the tab. <laughs> so I closed the program. Thank you. So if I come to your house, hide the cayenne, okay? Get rid of the cayenne. Thank you. All right, I promise I won't hit that tab again. So I want to share with you this quote. Listen to this from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 138. It says, In the road to death, the whole race may go with all their worldliness, all their selfishness, all their pride, dishonesty, and moral debasement. There's room for every man's opinions and doctrines, space to follow his inclinations to do whatever his self-love may dictate. In order to go in the path that leads to destruction, there is no need of searching for the way. For the gate is wide, and the way is broad, and our feet naturally turn into the path that ends in death. Ooh, isn't that interesting? So what is it that holds our moral fiber together? It's the Word of God, isn't it? And so, again, I want to review some of the things that I, that I talked about last night. Remember Jacob's new dress? Isn't it interesting? What's this little kid's name? What does Jacob mean in the Bible? Deceiver, all right? All right, so isn't that interesting that we've got Jacob in a dress, but Jacob's name himself even means deceiver. And so this is going to be valuable. Remember last night we talked about the princess boy, and his dad tells him how pretty he looks in his dress. He, tell, he holds him by the hand and tells him to twirl. Remember that? Did you know that in England, in London, England, there is a 1,000% increase on transgenderism among children? 
And what that means is that these children are being groomed to take these hormones for the rest of their life, to be on these hormone blockers so that they can have the sex change that they desire even before they're of the legal age that they can vote in their own country. And this is what's going on in the world. And so that's why I have this program called Who Am I? Now, originally it was called In His Image, which I really like better. But remember, if we're to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves, then we want this program to appeal to everybody. So if it says in his image, people automatically will assume that that's a Christian program and that may shut it down from even being able to see it. But if we call it, who am I? Isn't that the verbiage that we hear you know, in contemporary society? So let's use what we can so that we can engage in people and hopefully help to influence them in, in the ways of God, right? And so what I do is I take the children on, is this, do I need this? Can I move? All right, I can move. I think I can move. So with children, what I do is I started off with them, K through sixth grade, and there's all these children there. And you know how restless children are? So remember, parents and teachers, when you're dealing with children, give them something to get involved with. So basically what I do is I put this on the screen and I go, am I a zebra? And of course the crowd shouts, no. And I say, am I a giraffe? No. You know, kids get this concept pretty easy. Am I a dog? No. Am I a cat? No. And so what we start to do is we start to do this little game with children where we engage them and we start taking them through silly little games. Well, this silly little game is going to lead up to the hypocrisy and the ridiculousness of this new age movement coming in that I can change my gender and change who I am. But we're really subtle. So we start to engage the kids and they say, no, I'm not a cat. And so then the next slide comes up and say, who are we? Well, we're boys and girls, right? And then I read from Genesis 1, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So again, I just reason with the kids. I go, God made two kinds of people. Just two kinds. How many? Two. That's, you guys are better than those little kids. And so two kinds of people, male and female. I say, so if you're a boy, stand up. And then all of a sudden the boys all stand up and the girls don't dare. You know, they just sit there. And the guys, you know, they stand up because guys like to move and they jiggle and they wiggle and they're moving around and say, yeah, yeah, I'm a guy, right? And then all of a sudden I say, if you're a girl, stand up. So then the boys drop. They drop so fast because they don't want to be in that group. And the girls stand up. Am I right? Right? And so the whole idea is get them engaged. Let them participate. Let them be a part of the process. And every time that they do these exercises, you're imprinting in their mind that, yes, I'm a boy or, yes, I'm a girl. Does that make sense, right? And then we also want to talk to them about the fact that God created his image in us, that we are also the image of God, and that's how he gave us boys and girls, two kinds. And especially with young children, you want to review this every day. You want to go over these principles so that these principles are, are embedded in their heart and in their soul. So again, Genesis chapter 1, verse 10, and it talks about how creation was good. And, you know, I kind of minimize this a little bit, not that it's a, a, a little thing, but there's an emphasis that I want to put on a part. And so I say, you know what, after every day, when God was done creating that day, after, after the first day, after the second day, third day, God stood back and he said, yeah, this is good, right? That's good. But when he created Adam and Eve, look at this, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, he said, when God created man and woman, he stood back and he said, whoa, this is very good. Isn't that right? Come on, come on right? This is very good. Why? Because the image of God was expressly put into the relationship between one man and one woman. Why? Because it takes one of each. It takes one man and one woman sexually coming together because what happens when a man and a woman come together that are in a committed relationship under God and they have a sexual relationship? It makes babies. Kids even understand this concept. And so the beautiful thing is, is that God is a God of creation. God is a creative God. He speaks and things are created. And so God bypassed the angels, which created a little higher than, than humans. And what he did is he gave the gift of creation to man, a characteristic of God in the relationship between a man and a woman. And that's not a dirty thing, brothers and sisters. That's a good thing. That's a blessing that came directly from God. And in that expression of creating life, is the very image of our creator. Do you see how beautiful and profound that is? But you know, we in Christianity, it's like, calm down, Mike. You know, we don't want our kids to learn that that young. You know, we want to keep their innocence, right? 
So how is it that we keep their innocence if we don't let them know that there's a great gift that was given to mommies and daddies and the establishment of the family, even in the Garden of Eden? It was never a dirty thing until sin came around, right? And so uh, how, many of ki how many kinds of people did God create? Let's see if my little images come out. Boys and girls. Isn't that cute? And so it's very simple. So when God created only two kinds, and you want to stress this point, you only created two kinds, male and female. And then what happened? God told Adam that Eve was to be his wife. Isn't that beautiful? And then marriage was created in the Garden of Eden. A very beautiful thing, a blessing. One of the two institutions that God established in the Garden of Eden. What was the other one? That's right, and we're experiencing that today. So God then told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. And then what happened? They had a sexual relationship, and they started to get pregnant, and they started to have children. And so this is a very elementary lesson, and I thank the lady that gave me these cords. And so we have two kinds. God created two kinds, male and female, right? And so what happens, what happens when these two come together? It produces power, isn't that right? And that power is the creative power of what God has given to each one of us in an exclusive relationship between one man and one woman. So what happens when two women come together? What happens? No power. Thank you. No power. And then what happens when two men come together? No power. And then what happens if a transgender person who's mutilated their sexual organs comes together? No power. Again, so the, this is a very simple element, and I think it beautifully explains how the image of God is created in one man and one woman through the marriage, through the pregnancy, then through the family. And then what you're doing is you're letting your children know that a fam the family is a blessing from God, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. Isn't that beautiful? So in a very simple way, we're establishing this. And then we can use examples in the Bible. Take some time and ask your children to show you examples of families in the Bible. It's very simple. Look at this. Jesus was even given to Joseph and Mary, male and female parents. God has given man the gift to create life. Come on, that's worthy of something, isn't it? That's a huge thing. But I think that we minimize the beautiful gift of what God has given to us for fear that our children are going to learn something that they shouldn't learn, right? But let's move on. So we then talk about Lucifer. Lucifer fell from heaven, right? And you can take it to uh, Isaiah chapter 14. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Boy, that's some really pompous words, isn't it? So we want to really show our children that the desire of the enemy is to be in the same place as God, right? He says, uh, yet you shall be brought down to, uh, to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. I didn't really need to read that part. But the point being is that we know that there's an enemy of souls, and this enemy of souls wants to be in the position that God is in. And so imagine how an angel who was created higher than the humans was bypassed to have the very gift and the image of God placed in a man where we can create life, but he cannot. Do you imagine how that made him angry? Imagine how angry the enemy got? So if the enemy is angry because we got this precious gift to create life, which is an example of what the life giver gives, what do you think he's going to want to do to that gift? You guys are really bright. All right, so Psalms uh, verse eight, or chapter 8 and verse 5. For thou hast made mankind a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. So Satan, of course, is jealous that we have this gift that is like God. So remember in John chapter 10 and verse 10, it says, A thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And so we want to make sure that our young people know that the devil is out there and he's going to try to steal, kill, and to destroy the precious gift that God has given to one man and one woman in a, in a, a committed relationship under God. Does that make sense? So we've given our children a whole lot. End of the first day. That's it. You guys can go home. But that's all right. We've got four more days to cover. But isn't that beautiful? Is that a dirty thing? Did I, did I bring up something dirty? 
No, I showed the beauty of God and the blessings that he gave to us, the affirmation of two kinds, male and female. And those are principles that with your children, you're going to want to review as often as you can with examples so that these principles are in their sweet little mind. Second day. Everyone is unique. Each one of us is unique. And yes, we recognize again, you might want to do a little review. All the girls stand up and then all the guys stand up and do this review. But then you want to talk about the fact that even though there's two kinds, each one of us is completely individual. If you separated all the guys on this side and all the girls on this side, we would look at each other, guys, and we would know that we're uniquely different from everybody else, except for David. He kind of looks like me a little bit, don't you think? All right, so, so you want to establish these facts, but then we want to take it into a little bit of a different thing. We want to talk about the fact that each one of us was created differently than everybody else, that each one of us has fingerprints, right? And you want to show everybody your fingerprints, and you want to show your kids your fingerprints, and you want to look at their fingerprints and compare it. Maybe you could do a little study where you put a little ink pad, and everybody does their little fingerprints, and we compare them and say, hey, this is Johnny's fingerprints, and look at Alice's fingerprints. They don't match. They're completely unique. And all of this is, again, is to let them know that they're special to God, that you were created by a loving God who even before the earth was formed, he knew who you were. So God created each of us individually, he's totally unique from each other, but according to the Bible, he only made how many kinds? Two kinds, male and female. So again, doing another review that God created male and female, but biology, now we want to switch it a little bit over to biology. DNA... The DNA that runs in your veins is also your fingerprint. Did you know that? That you might scar your hand and you might change your fingerprint, but guess what? Your DNA inside your blood will always stay the same, and there are only two kinds of DNA, male and female. Isn't that cool? So God's giving us another affirmation, another example, that we are unique and separate, but yet there's only two kinds. So while each one of us has different DNA because of the parents that we come from, there's only two kinds of DNA, male and female. So now what I want to do is I want to segue into an area that's really difficult for young kids. And as somebody who is tortured by bullying in school, I want to segue to the way that kids view each other. And so the next thing that I want to talk about is there are differences for males. You know what? There's a lot of different kinds of ways to be a male. You know, some are macho men and they like sports a lot. Oh, I don't know that I do that so convincingly, but... Then there are gentlemen, you know, or there's some guys that like the arts and they like to play piano and they like to play instruments. And so there are many ways to be a boy. Isn't that right? And so we need to celebrate those differences. And maybe in a classroom setting, you can celebrate those differences and you can say, oh, you know, little Eddie, he likes to play the piano and he's really good at that. Or, or little Catherine, or we're going to talk about guys. So like maybe uh, Timmy, he likes to play four different instruments. Or maybe um, Johnny likes to sing in the choir. And then there's other kids that like sports and they like to get out and they like to uh, run around in mud. Now, I was the type of kid, my hair was never messed up. It was always perfect when I came home from school, but that was just the kind of kid I was. But again, because I didn't feel like I measured up, that I didn't, uh, I wasn't like the tough guys in school, I wasn't picked for the, to the sports like they were, I felt inadequate as I was. And so what that did is that moved me into thinking that maybe I would be better off defined as a girl. So what we want to do is we want to celebrate the differences of boys. We want to teach children not to make fun of kids that aren't like us, but instead to include them. We include you because you are a guy. You're a boy. It doesn't matter what you like to do, right? And so we want to do the same thing um, for girls. There are many ways to be a boy. So there are differences in females. You know, we have some girls that are girly girls, and they like lace and flowers and all kinds of things. And then there are sporty girls. There are girls that like to climb trees and, 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 um, and play sports and things. It doesn't make you less of a girl. And we want to talk about those distinctions. And again, to give the children an opportunity to recognize that just because you're a girl, you're included, right? Because again, the Bible says that our words have the power of life and death. And for the first 12 years that I was in early education, I went to 10 different schools within those 12 years. In third grade, I went to three different schools. And you know what? Every new year was a crapshoot. I had no idea if I was going to be accepted or picked on. As a matter of fact, in seventh grade, I had to be protected by these two big black girls in my school because the other kids, they would kick my books out from under me or beat me up. So these two girls would follow me to my classes to keep me from getting beat up. It was a really rough year. 
And so again, we want to make sure that our children learn early on that our words have power and meaning and that there's a zero tolerance for bullying, but that doesn't mean that we throw out the truth of God. Instead, we establish the truth of God as it is and that there are many ways to be a boy and girl. Isn't that beautiful? Okay. All right, so then, then <laughs> thank you, Joyce. So then my next point is I say, hey, do you like to dress up? What kid do you know that doesn't like to dress up? Let me give you an example. I love this example. My nephew, a cute little three-year-old kid, right? He's running around in the house, and his mother got him this, this DVD, and it was Samson and Samson. Yeah, it was, the, it was the story of Samson. So on the back cover of this DVD, it shows Samson with those big muscles, and he's holding this huge rock, this big square rock, and the look on his face, you know, he's straining. So he's got this look on his face. It kind of looks like a smile. My nephew interpreted that as a smile. My sister, she went to the store and she found him this muscle shirt. So it was like flesh colored, but it had muscles built into it. And my nephew, he would wear that every day for several hours. And he would take the sofa cushion off the sofa and he would walk around the house holding that sofa cushion above his head with a big smile on his face like this. Because <laughs> he was imitating Samson, right? I mean, it's cute, isn't it? So again, kids like to dress up. Kids like to pretend. And God gave each one of us a great imagination. And let me put this plug in at this moment, that when children don't know the difference between imagination and real, then what right do we have to tell children that they can choose their sex or their identity? What they need is reality. They need opportunities to play and to act things out, but they need reality rather than these ideas of fantasy that I can be anything or whatever that I want to be. So again, the whole idea of this instruction is to let children know that they have many ways to identify themselves, but that there are two kinds, male and female, and that God has given to us a very specific identity, right? So again, asking the kids, do you like to play dress up? Yes, of course, every kid likes to play dress up. And so some kids may imitate Bible characters. Some uh, children may imitate certain animals. You know, it's fun to throw a sheet over the kitchen table and pretend that that's a fort or a den or whatever you want. And so at the end of the day, what happens? We take off our, our costumes and we put them away. So at the end of the day, you know, we may be able to pretend, we may be able to act like we're something else. But again, when we're done playing, what do we do? We take up our costume and we put it away and then I become Johnny again, right? So this is a very, very, very important principle that we want to in, in, instill in our children to let them know that, yes, we can pretend by the way we make our appearance, but at the end of the day, we're still who we are, who God made us to be, male or female, right, with unique DNA. So it's fun to pretend. We want to go through a couple of these things. It disguises who we are, but does it really change who we are and process with their children? And they go... Yes, I love to pretend, but no, it doesn't change who I am. It gives us the appearance of something or someone else. Sometimes our disguise can really fool people. But again, at the end of the day, we take off our costumes and put them away, and then we're ourselves again. Unfortunately, many children have a very difficult life. And so when they take off that costume and they put it away, it's very difficult to be who they are. And we want to be exceptionally sensitive to this. But we also want to let them know the reality is that we, it is unchangeable. We can't change our DNA. That's our fingerprint. That's who we were made to be, all right, regardless of, of what we may be going through. Genesis chapter 27, I think, is a very powerful lesson on this, using the Bible whenever we can. And isn't it cool that God has given to us through these stories of the Bible that we can use in our everyday lives with our children? I love it. You don't have to agree with me, but I still love it. So anyway, with, um, with, with Jacob, we want to talk about the fact that Jacob's name means deceiver, supplanter, right? He was a liar. And so what did Jacob do? He disguised himself, didn't he? And what did he do? He tried to disguise himself as his brother. And what did he do when he used that disguise? Did he use it for a good thing or a bad thing? Very good. He used it as a bad thing, and he tricked his father into giving him his brother's birthright. And so what happened because he disguised himself? Some bad things happened to Jacob, didn't it? And we want to process that. And some of the bad things that ha happened to Jacob is that he was never able to see his mother again. And then when he did see his brother, his brother wanted to kill him. And so there was some really negative things that happened because he disguised who he really was and took something that didn't belong to him. Powerful story. And when we use this, we want to let our children know that it's important how we represent ourselves to other people. 
Isn't it interesting that in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5 it says, A woman shall not wear that which pertains unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So let's be very clear about this, parents, sisters. When you dress up your little brother as a little girl and you put him in those cute little clothes, it's not funny. It's not cute. You're committing an abomination. Have I made myself clear? Because I, I see this happen all the time. I see pictures that are posted of somebody dressing up their little brother as a little girl. And you don't understand the power of what that does to a child that may be struggling with an identity issue. Like I said yesterday, when my aunt would tease my hair and style it like a woman in the mirror when I was six years old, it gave me this incredible power, this feeling that maybe one day I would be convincing as a little girl. When we start implanting those thoughts and those feelings inside little kids, whether it's boys dressing up as girls or girls dressing up as boys, you're setting something in motion that your children may not be able to stop on their own. It's not funny. It's not cute. How about the man yesterday, Walt Heyer, who was dressed up as a little girl by his grandmother. Every weekend she had him and she would make these beautiful dresses. By the time he was seven years old, their little secret was out. She never dressed him up again, but already what was set in motion in Walt's mind was that he was valueless as a boy and his only value to his grandmother was as a little girl. Something was set in motion, all right? So again, according to God, it's important. It's important that we, that we um, separate ourselves and that we make it very obvious those who are boys and those who are girls. Let me give you a, an adult version of this. You know, there's a big issue going on about women's ordination, and I'm not even going to touch that topic, but I want to be very clear from, from a, an ex-homosexual, ex-sex addict's perspective. When I came into the church, I said, who cares? You know, let the women run the church. They'll probably do a better job. You know, you give all the men the day off in church, and, you know, the women, they, they run a lot of things anyway. They could probably do a very good job. However... God was very specific in how he, on how he laid things out, and I'm a beneficiary of that. Because when I came into my church culture, and I went to the first uh, foot washing that they had at my church, there was a man that came up to me and asked if he could wash my feet. And as he started to wash my feet, and because I was so used to, to being uh, avoided by the men, afraid that if I shook their hand, they, they might get something on them, this man was not afraid to wash my feet. And as he washed my feet, he just said kind words, and the Holy Spirit was working, and then this room had only four other guys in it. It was a very small church. And as this brother started to pray over me, every man in that room was moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, get up and touch him. And those men came over to me and they put their hand on my shoulder. And as my brother prayed for me, I realized that I was no longer part of the ladies' lunch club. That I was now being included by the guys. I was being affirmed by the guys. And that affirmation was healing to something that had gone terribly wrong for many years of my life. It's important to know who the guys are. And it's important to know who the girls are. Because some of us need to know the distinction and the difference. Isn't God amazing? He's not the author of confusion. He's the author of peace, right? Okay, end of the second day. Isn't this fun? Okay, good. You're with me. So again, who am I? Third day, the flood. And it's really interesting because as I started to explore this, and I just thought, well, isn't it a cute idea, the whole idea of the two animals going into the ark? But then it really started to open up my eyes that this story has a bigger application to today than we could ever even imagine. And there's a lot of things that are going to open up on this. So why did Noah have to build an ark? And you start talking to the children about this. And what's really great is in Cradle Roll, you paint a big rainbow on the room. You know, you build a, a, a makeshift ark, and then you put the stuffed animals on there two by two. And you teach children this very important lesson. However, I think that we, as educators, owe our children more. Because what we can do is with our two- and three-year-olds, we can actually teach them the principles of identity very early on through this beautiful illustration. So let me demonstrate. So again, how many did God call into the ark? And the children shout, they go, two of every animal. And I said, that's right. And who called the animals? Genesis 6, verse 19, And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Again, this is another affirmation that God created how many kinds? Two, that's right, male and female. And I said, okay, so they, all the animals came in two by two, right? I said, what if God brought in two females? Is that what he did? And the kids go, no. And I said, well, was it two boys? 
No. Well, what was it? And they go, a boy and a girl. And they go, why? Why would God bring in a boy and a girl? And the kids in unison, in their simple understanding, who understand this much better than adults, they say, because they need to make babies. And I go, that's right. <laughs> it's beautiful. Your children will do the story for you. And so what's beautiful is to affirm the fact that God called the animals two by two into the ark, right? And you can do a little illustration. You can remind them of their stuffed animals. You can show them two animals going on to the ark, a boy and a girl. And there's some other examples that we'll do a little bit later. But again, that principle is so elementary, and you can use this in a powerful way, again, to affirm God's design. So Genesis 7, verse 9, there... There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. Now, now it would be a construct to basically say, you know what, that was Noah's deci- decision to bring in, you know, two animals, one of every kind. But uh-uh. What I love about Ellen White, what I love about Spirit of Prophecy is she gives us just a little bit more. Don't you love that? Amen. Come on, come on. Do you? Amen. Let me give you an example. I was really upset. Do you remember the uh, demoniacs? Right? Do you remember them? And thank you, Ellen. It was two, not one. So anyway, um, she says that there were two demoniacs in that graveyard. And when they were healed, when Jesus was sitting them and they were in their right mind, as I read Ellen White's description of them, they had lost their manhood in making life a grand carnival. Guess what? That was me. And so I relate to those demoniacs. And as I was relating to the demoniacs and Jesus was there healing and he wasn't afraid of them and they had lost their mind, as he was sitting with them in the right mind and he was getting ready to leave, they begged him. They said, Jesus, please take us with you. And he said, no, stay here. And you know what? Tell your story in the city. And I'm telling you, for somebody like me, I was really upset by that. I really questioned even my faith and I thought, these guys wanted to be with you. You picked those 12 lousy guys and they couldn't even get along together and here's two guys begging you to stay with you and you won't let them stay with you? Can I get a witness? When I read what Ellen White wrote about those demoniacs. And she gave me just enough, and I believe that that was written just for me, if not for anybody else. She said that if they would have been with Jesus, they would have been in his company. But instead, because they obeyed the Lord and they told what they had seen and what God had done in their lives, she said this, their work that they did in that city, they became the first foreign missionaries. And she said that as they were witnessing about what they had done and experienced Uh, in that city, that they were as close as if they were in the very presence of Jesus Christ. I dropped to my knees right then, and I thank God for just that little bit of extra because it helped me know that Jesus wasn't casting them away, that he was closer to them in their work as if they were in his very presence. Wow. Wow, isn't that beautiful? Okay, so again, let me come back to the story. So um, so Patriarchs and Prophets gives us just a little bit more, and in my... (laughs) In my, what, 50-some years of living, I didn't know this principle. Maybe many of you did. But this is what she said. Beasts of every description, the fiercest as well as the most gentle, were seen coming from mountain and forest and quietly making their way toward the ark. Quietly making their way toward the ark. Animals obeyed the command of God, guided by holy angels, not Noah. They went in two and two unto Noah into the ark. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters, If you were an antediluvian and you saw the animals coming on their own, lining up in file, right? Cows and chickens and tigers and horses and elephants, two by two, just coming out of the woodwork and all of a sudden working towards the ark, would you not know that something was up? Would God have to write you a personal letter to let you know something's going down? And yet, isn't it sad that only eight people got on that ark? And so again, God is very plain and he gives us plenty of evidence to let us know exactly what his intention is for us. And we want to make sure that we we show those points to our children at any time that we can. So again, who did God tell to get on the ark? Everybody, right? The invitation was for everyone. And so I asked the kids, I said, so who got on the ark? And they say, Noah and his sons. And I go, is that all? And they go, no, you know, Noah's wives also came, or Noah's wife also came. And I said, all right, well, what about his sons? Yes, their wives came too. They know this story. And I said, well, why do you think that Noah's sons brought their wives? So they could have babies. Again, these kids, they know this. So again, you want to let them know that they're, that they're smart. You want to reward them. You want to say, that's great. You understand the principle. And to use this as opportunities to affirm again the, uh, the, the combination of one male and one female, right? So who, what was the purpose of calling the animals onto the ark? 
Genesis 7, verse 2, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Another um, affirmation. Then again, you want to take your kids on a field trip. Do kids like field trips? Come on now, right? So you, we want to make these principles indelible into their mind, and so we want to take our kids. If you're an inner city kid, what are the chances that you're going to be able to see life on a farm? Very small, right? So you want to take your kids to a farm. And if you live in the country, then you want to take your kids uh, to a place where you have lots of animals and pigs and goats and all this kind of stuff because nothing says more about the creation and the intention of God than going to a farm. If you want to know about sex, then take your kids to a farm. We were talking... <laughs> Stop it, Joyce. We were talking to some uh, younger people or whatever. I was saying that kiddingly. So uh, we, were, we were talking to some younger kids or whatever, and this one kid said, you know what? I was a very inquisitive child, and I had lots of questions about things that I was seeing or whatever, and unfortunately, the kids went to a park, and they saw two animals engaging in an act. And then all of a sudden, of course, that just burst this kid. And what are they doing? You know, why are they doing that? And, bah, bah, bah. and all these questions came out. And a lot of times parents say, how do I know what to say you know, to my children? How do I guard them and not give them too much, but yet give them enough to understand what's going on? And so, of course, I'm not a parent, but I do believe that if your kid asks you a question, don't be talking about the stork. Don't be talking about the cabbage patch, you know, with your kids. Your children need to know that you're a source of authority. Am I right? My parents told me about Santa Claus at Christmas time. And so I asked my parents directly. I had two younger sisters and I said, is Santa real? And my mom and my dad, they said, oh, yes, yeah, Santa is very real. And I go, okay. Well, I asked you directly. That's what they told me. So, okay, I guess he's real. But then all of a sudden the next year I found out that he wasn't. And so guess what? My parents were no longer reliable as a source of information. And so if they lied about Santa Claus, did they lie about Jesus Christ also? Wouldn't that be fair to say? So we have a precious opportunity. Your children should know that you are the source of information more than anybody else in this world. And if your children come to you and they say something that might be dirty or disgusting, when you act appalled or offended, you've now reduced your ability to relate to your children where they're coming from. If you scream and say, that's disgusting, that's horrible, that's filthy, you shouldn't think that thought, you now shut down the opportunity to have real communication with your children. Let me tell you a story that I think is just remarkable. It brought me to tears. There was a, a woman, she came up to us. We were presenting to the pastors in the uh, Michigan conference. Her husband was a pastor, and she was organizing this ladies' lunch, and it was very lovely. You know, they had nice little finger foods or whatever, and they invited coming out ministries to have a Q&A with the pastor's wives. So after the Q&A, this lady comes up. She looked very conservative. She had her hair pulled back nicely or whatever. She had a big smile on her face. Betsy, are you here? Is Betsy here? Anyway, she looked like Betsy. So that's, you know, this very lovely lady. She came up with this big smile, and she said, you know what, I understand exactly what you were saying. And my colleague and I, we looked at her and said, come on, please, you, you understand what we've been through? And she started to share with us. And she said, I was raised in a good Adventist home. I don't know why, but at five years old, I came up to my mother and I said, mother, I want to see a naked man. I know. But her mother didn't overreact. Instead, her mother became clinical. And she said, well, I don't really have a naked man to show you. I guess we could ask your father. And the girl said, no, no, I don't want to see father. And she said, well, men have more muscles than we do, and men have more hair than we do. And what she did is she gave her enough information to satisfy her curiosity, and she moved on. But she did not belittle her daughter. She didn't shame her. She didn't make her feel bad. Instead, she answered her question clinically and moved on. You're going to love this part. So several years later, this little girl had grown up. She was probably about 12 or 13, and she had younger brothers and sisters. They were cleaning out a house as a, a missionary effort, and as they were cleaning out the house, she opened up a cupboard, and there was a centerfold of a naked man, a lumberjack, wearing nothing but a smile. She ripped that poster down. She hid it, and what do you think she did with it? She said, Mother, look, a naked man. <laughs> if she was shamed and belittled for her earlier question, she never would have run to her mother. Maybe she would have run to her friend. Maybe she would have run to a boy in the neighborhood. Do you, are you following what I'm saying? 
But because her mother made herself a source of information that she couldn't be shamed by, that her mother would tell her the truth and tell her it in an honest way, that's what she did. She brought it to her mother and she said, look, mother, a naked man. And her mother didn't overreact <gasps> and rip the poster off and say you're shameful and spank her and punish her or whatever. Instead, she said, well, you've always wanted to see a naked man. There he is. <laughs> and she said, well, look at that. Wasn't I right? Doesn't he have more muscles than we do? Yes, mother, he does. Doesn't he have more hair than we do? Yes, mother, he does. And after they addressed all of the biological differences between men and women, then she did the remarkable thing and she said, but look at his face. What's he doing? Well, he's smiling, mother. What do you think he's smiling about? I don't know. Do you think he's a Christian? I don't know. Do you think he's married? Do you think he holds the door open for his wife? Do you think he has children? That's when I started to cry. Because what she did is she affirmed the physical, but then she brought it back to the spiritual. And what she did is she took this example of something that was hideous and heinous, but what she did is she, she baptized it in the Holy Spirit and she brought her daughter's thoughts towards the spiritual rather than to the physical to affirm the fact that when you pick a husband, it's not about the hair and the muscles, it's really about what goes on in between their ears and are they a good person and are they dedicated to God. And that's when the tears came out of my face because as a little boy struggling with my identity, thinking that I was a girl, my parents weren't safe. Are you? If you're a parent, are you safe? Are you an authority to your children? Will you tell them the truth? Will you tell them the truth without shaming them or making them feel guilty? Are you a source where your children run to you first instead of the kids in the neighborhood or to their teachers or to their school? Because when you are the source of all information for your children, they'll respect you. And when things come up in the world, they'll be able to come to you and say, Mommy, somebody touched me where I shouldn't have been touched. Oops, I'm sorry, I talked too much. I heard that, okay. Okay, so again, we wanna to go to a review with our children. Can two boy dogs have puppies? Of course the kids say no. Can two kit, female kittens have, two female cats have kittens? No. Can two male tigers have baby tigers? No. What does it take to make babies, a male and a female? And if you don't have the opportunity to go to a farm, and I think that you should, you know, when you give children, you know, something in nature that they can really see that's real, it's a much better object lesson than to just show them pictures in a book. But you still want to do something to show them the differences between male tigers and female tigers, right? Even God dresses them a little bit different. So you want to give them those opportunities. And this is the end of the third day. We got two more days. Are you okay? Okay. All right. So who am I? Day four. So again, a little review. He made two kinds, male and female. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female. So I am, I am given the image of God. It's something that he blessed me with that he didn't give to the angels because when I get married to my wife of the opposite sex, that we create babies, that is a gift from God, and the image of God is expressly in us. We know that the devil wants to destroy this image, so he's going to do anything that he can to take this precious gift away. And you don't have to be specific about the LGBT thing. Children will just understand it when they start to see it. Does that make sense? You put in the principles and let everything else take its course and it'll happen. When God created man and woman, he stood back and he said, this isn't just good, it's very good. Differences between males, there's macho men and gentlemen, many ways to be a boy. Differences for females, there's sporty girls and girly girls, many ways to be a girl. Jacob disguised himself as his brother Esau. What was the purpose of calling the animals onto the ark? Again, male and female, taking your kids to the farm, their little, their little uh, outing. So while you've done all of this, and you can take weeks and months to do this, and you can, you can address the topic according to the age group of your children. If your children need more information, be sure to give it to them. But if your children are innocent still, you want to make sure that you give them just enough information to satisfy their curiosity, but not to instruct them in other things that may cause them to fall. So God covered the sky with a rainbow. Look at my face. Do you see where we're going with this? Listen, brothers and sisters, do not be ashamed of the rainbow. Do not cower from it. Do not be afraid of it. When it's shoved into your face, celebrate it. And I'm going to show you how. So what does the rainbow represent? I love this part, you guys. I love this part. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 13 to 15. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. 
And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow is a representation of a covenant. It's a covenant. It's not pride. It's a covenant. And the principle behind this is that God is giving us a rainbow after every storm to let us know that he honors a covenant that he makes. And a covenant is an agreement between two parties. You're not dragged into, kick, you're not dragged into this agreement kicking and screaming. It's your choice. And when I chose to get baptized 20 years ago, I was making a decision to follow Jesus Christ, and he honored that covenant with me. I broke it many times, but he still honored his part in it. And the rainbow is a reminder to me that my precious Savior honors this covenant that he's made with me and that I can always come into this covenant and know that I'm protected. Isn't that beautiful? Can you let your kids know that principle? There's nothing to be ashamed of when you see a rainbow. But we're going to teach the children something special. Seven is a very important number in the Bible, isn't it? What does seven represent? Oh, you guys are good. You said it first time. Completion, which leads to perfection. Isn't that right? Completion leads to perfection. So God says that when it's all said and done, that we'll be perfect. And I'm not a perfectionist. And if you look too closely, you'll see that I'm not. However, I'm in that process. And Mary Magdalene had to be healed seven times of demons. That meant that Jesus kept healing her until it was complete. And how many times did the, did the general have to dip into that dirty, filthy river before he was cleansed of leprosy? Seven times. That means that God does not just work with instantaneous uh, effects. Sometimes it's a process of cleansing. Please, can I get an amen for that? Because I wish the moment that I walked out of that watery grave when I was baptized, I thought that I would come out straight, ready to date, mate, and procreate. But recognizing that this was a process, I had to not keep dipping literally in that water, but I had to constantly come to Jesus as I was, broken and defiled, until the process was complete. And if somebody would have helped me with that, I wouldn't have had to go through all of this agony in my mind thinking that I did something wrong or that I must be unlovable or unsavable. The next time you see a baptism, I hope that you'll realize that that person is just beginning their journey. And rather than think, well, you've done the 27 fundamentals, be on your way and don't sin anymore. Because that's when people are just beginning their journey with Jesus Christ. What is it you said to me, Joyce? Within the first six months, that's when the devil attacks you the most after you're baptized? Isn't that when we really need to support each other and love each other? Instead of <laughs> abandoning them, because now I've done my work, you know, I did my Bible studies, signed and completed, you're baptized. That's when we really want to start relying on people and, and engaging them in relationships, right? Okay, so how many colors does, the, does God's rainbow have? Well, I gave you the answer. I don't know that that was so hard. So again, it gives us seven colors. What are those colors? It's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And in that order, because God is a God of order. Am I right? You want to stress that with your children. God is very specific. And God's rainbow has seven colors. You know, unfortunately, where was I? I was in Austria. And I was giving this presentation, and I went down to the basement to get some water. And I looked in the cradle room, and they had a six-colored rainbow. I know, I know. So how does the rainbow talk about God's love? It talks about the covenant that he makes with each one of us. You know what? The rainbow covers the righteous and the unrighteous. Isn't that right? So again, as Christians, I hope that you'll remember that this covenant God wants to make with everybody, even if they don't agree with you, even if they walk against you, even if they persecute you, remember that rainbow covers everyone. All right? So how is the rainbow used in the Bible? In Genesis chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And while God does create a covenant with those who walk with him, that the rainbow also covers the unrighteous and the righteous as well. Because I believe his desire is that one day we would all be in union with him, right? So what was the rainbow for? To remind us of a promise. And what does the rainbow cover? Everyone. And who does the rainbow cover? All of us. So Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1, it says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. That's how important the rainbow is, brothers and sisters. It started in Genesis, but when Jesus comes again, there's going to be another rainbow over his head. 
Something that just hit me when I gave this presentation just a few, few days ago is the thought that we know that the devil is going to imitate the coming of Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? Would it surprise you if that included a rainbow? And what if that rainbow didn't have seven colors? I don't know. It's just a thought. I'm not prophetic. So Revelation chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in, in sight like unto an emerald. So even the throne of God is going to be covered by a seven-colored rainbow. We want to make sure that our children understand the seven-colored rainbow. Let them draw that on paper. Let them paint with their paints. You know, take out their crayons. Make sure that they have all seven colors and in the proper order. Teach your children how to identify a rainbow so that when they see a six-colored, four-colored, or a two-colored rainbow, your children will know and they'll say, wait a minute, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's not God's rainbow. Because a lot of times I find myself being afraid to really talk about the rainbow for fear that I'm going to push children into an identity that's being promoted by a six-colored rainbow. Can I get a witness? Am I the only one? We don't have to be ashamed of the rainbow. We had it first. And it was a blessing and a gift from God. And so instead of hiding from it and not talking about it and not sharing it, make sure that you teach your children about the seven-colored rainbow so that they can celebrate it and know that it was straight from God and it was a covenant that He wants with each one of us. Do you see the beauty in that? Do you see the application to today, how you can educate your children and fortify them against the enemy? End of the day four. The best day is coming. Hang on. And I'll, I'll try to be quick. I know I'm just really going on. How much did God love me? Now, this was very important for me because as a young child, the only image that I got, the only example that I got of God as a father was through my own father. My dad was gone a lot. He wasn't really there. When my dad was home, he was abusive, loud, and angry. And so I put those characteristics on God up in heaven thinking that, well, I have a father and I know what he's like, so you must be the same way. So as a little kid, I wanted to do things right. I wanted to be a good kid. But I learned that God up in heaven, I had to treat him the same way I treated my dad. And so I obeyed my dad, not because I loved him, but because I feared him, and so I feared God also. There was a man who was so abused by his father, physically and, and emotionally, he said this, he said, it took me 50 years to wipe the image of my father off the image of God up in heaven. Am I the only one? I don't think so. So again, we want to make sure that our children understand that God loves them. I think it's the greatest principle, and I saved it for the last day because we want to let them know that every principle of the Bible, every principle of the rainbow, all the way to the creation story, giving us the blessing of creation was all done by a loving and a creative God who loves and cares for us. Does that make sense? That it wasn't by happenstance and it wasn't by chance that these things came to us. It's because he was intentional and he wanted to affirm us and make sure that we would be able to recognize him by looking at each other. So in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb. Isn't that beautiful? So th this is a promise. This lets me know that even before I was created, that God knew who I was. And that when I struggled with my identity, that I knew that I, knew that I wasn't um, a mistake. I knew that I wasn't a joke from God. That it was intentional that God knew who I was and who I was meant to be. Psalms 139 verse 5. You have protected me in front and behind. You have laid your hand upon me. Psalms 139, verse 5. As a matter of fact, Psalms 139 is the answer to the transgender question. You read that chapter in its entirety, and that's what converts a lot of people that are struggling with identity issues. Psalms 139, verse 10. Your hand will lead me, and your right hand will hold me. The first part of Psalms 139 talks about the affirmation of how much God loves you, how crazy God is about you, and that his thoughts towards you are as countless as the sands of the seashore. Pick a handful of sand and count that with your children and say, you know what? God's thoughts towards you are bigger than even this. Do you see these precious lessons that we can teach our children about God's love? Your thoughts towards me are precious, oh God. Your, thought, your good thoughts towards me are too many to count. But what if I'm confused about who I am? What if I struggle about my identity? And there are real issues. And some of you have children that really struggle with this. I had a gentleman call me on the phone. I don't know if I, if I shared this last night. Let me know and I'll stop. But there was a gentleman who called me. Oh, yeah, I know. I'm nearsighted. So anyway, there was a gentleman that called me and he said, my son is now calling himself a girl. And he said, 
is my son gay, is my son transgender? And I said, you know what, I don't really know. I said, you wouldn't really know until later. I said, but how much time do you spend with your son? And he said, you know, I don't really spend much time with my son. And he confessed to me that he really didn't like the personality of his son, a three-year-old kid. But I thought that that was important because the father admitted that he didn't like the personality of his son, so he worked a lot of hours. He said, many times I come home and my wife has already put him to bed, you know, and sometimes I go to work and my son's not even up in the morning. And I said, well, sir, I said, with all due respect, I think that your son is identifying with the only example he has. And I said, and if your mother, your wife is the one that's home with him and she's the one that's loving him and interacting with him, then it would be very natural that your son would identify with her. I said, if you want to help your son to develop healthy identity according to his biology, which is male, I said, you're going to have to make a commitment to your son. And I said, in spite of his personality that seems to rub against yours, I said, he needs you to show him what masculinity is. He, you need to draw him into a masculine identity, not to force him. I said, but you have to do things that he likes to do that doesn't affirm femininity, but rather draws him into masculinity. My father took me to shooting guns and, and watching dogs uh, do attack training. You know, he was trying to, to make me more masculine. But, you know, instead what that did is that made me push him further away. Masculinity was aggressive, and I wanted nothing to do with it. My mother gave me my father's pornography magazines when I was 10, thinking that that would help me with masculine development. But can you imagine the power if my father would have just gotten down on the living room floor with me and colored in my coloring book? to draw me into masculine identity, showing me that masculinity is not only something desirable, but something that I can attain to. And so I, I gave these principles to this man, and I said, you know what, get ready to, to invest in several years. I go, because this could take several years to, for your sons to, to develop you know, healthy masculinity. We prayed about it. He addressed his own uh, limitations about spending time with his family, but he called me six months later. And in that phone call, he said, you know, Mike, he said, I started taking care of my son in the evening, giving him his bath, you know, helping him with his devotions at night, and we would play a little bit in the evening when I come home from work. And he said, just last night, he said, we were getting ready for bed, and my son came up to me, and he said, Dad, let's play hide and seek for Mom because we're boys and she's a girl. I know, I know. Do you see the power of what we have? And if our children are confused, there's reasons why they're confused. And instead of beating them or, or ostracizing them or encouraging them, instead we have a great opportunity as the ones that they trust, as the ones that they come to. And if they share that they're struggling with identity, don't berate them, don't abuse them, don't hurt them, but instead understand them. Let them talk. Let them share with you what they're going through and then be intentional about praying and asking God to show you ways to draw them into the identity that they were born into. Doesn't that make sense? I have to rush. Your eyes saw my form and being incomplete. All my members are in your book which you made when before there was nothing. Isn't that beautiful? Search inside my heart, dear God. Look inside me and know my thoughts. And this is something you can pray with your children. Because, you know, sometimes our children don't have good thoughts. Sometimes us as adults don't have good thoughts. This verse is for you as well. Lord, look inside my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me to life everlasting. Jesus made us either boys or girls, and that was a gift. He knows how we were long before we were born. Celebrate that gift with your children. Celebrate the things about being a boy. Celebrate the things about being a girl. Make sure that your children know that this was a gift from God and that he was intentional about it. Psalms 139, 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are marvelous and that my soul knows it very well. In Psalms 139, verse 15, my body was not hid from you when I was made in secret. You knit my tiny inside parts together in my mother's belly. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Remove all my sin and lead me to heaven. What do you think, guys? Is there value in this? Do you see the power of the Holy Spirit to affirm and to share with our children what identity and sexuality is at an early age so that when they're confronted with the enemy and the deception, they will at least have a foundation. And while they still have choices to make, some very difficult choices to make, you can be the one that helps to give them the tools to help overcome what the enemy is putting out there in this world. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we've had to share tonight. 
And I thank you, Lord, for these principles that you have shown me through my own personal example, my own desperation, Lord, to really answer these questions that I've had since I was four years old. But I know, Lord, that there are many questions that these parents probably have. I look forward to the question and answer period that we have tomorrow with David. I ask, Lord, that you would, um, that you would give us good rest tonight, that you would help these principles to sink in. And for parents out there that have children that are struggling, for parents out there who maybe didn't understand these principles and, and lost the opportunity to share them with their children, Lord, it's not over because your power is still available for each one of us. Help us, Lord, to know that all power and all authority was given to you when you rose from the dead and that, Lord, that we can hold on to that power and claim that for our children until they come home. So until that moment, Lord, when we can receive you with both arms, I pray, Lord, that you will keep us and that you will implant these principles in our heart and that, Lord, that our children will be safe and that they will be guarded, Lord, by the information that we give them rather than what the world gives them. I thank you and I praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.